The Bible says in Exodus chapter 14, verse 16, that Moses raises his staff before God split the sea. God tells Moses in this chapter, in this verse, raise your staff and and I'll split the sea. Raise the staff so the, the sea can be split. There was a move that Moses had to make in order for God to move. There was a move that Abraham had to make in order for God to move. And then in Joshua chapter six, verses one to five, Joshua and Israel, they shouted before God tore the walls. They had to shout. There was this move that was from the human aspect that made the God of the universe move supernaturally. It seems like this principle is a really powerful key to see God move. That when I move, he moves. And anytime God made a supernatural move, he asked people to make a natural move first. Can you say first? First. Come on, wake up your neighbor. Be like, first. First. Wake up. (laughs) It's a principle. That sometimes we're praying, God, send me the wife. And you're expecting God to show up with this woman inside your room because you haven't gotten up yet. We're expecting God to give us a promotion and you haven't gone to school to actually move up your education so that you can fit the promotion. You're asking God to give you the influence but you don't have the character. Did you see that new Netflix TV show, Aaron Aaron Hernandez? A young man that made a $40 million deal with a football team, he was pro. And then just a few days later, they find out that he killed somebody. And then after they start investigating him, they find out that he killed two other people too. What is it about rising to success that makes young men fall? It's the lack of character and God loves you too much to move in your life without you moving first. You gotta move first. The natural part is oftentimes an insignificant part in the miracle where you almost never even see the connection between your natural move and God's supernatural move. Between your natural move and God's supernatural, there's this thing, this this move that you have to make. Oftentimes, it's not even connected. There has to be a sense of responsibility that is born within us and makes us move. Can you say move? Move. But something happened. Say it to me, something happened. Something happened. Something happened. God tells Joshua, Go around seven laps, circle Jericho, a city that you are going to conquer. I've given you that city, conquer it. But the walls, Lord God, they have fortified walls. We can't get in. And God was like, okay, listen to me. You're going to walk around it. And on the seventh lap, on the seventh day, you're going to shout. Previous to that, don't make a noise. Don't make a sound. But shout on the seventh day, on the seventh lap. When you shout, I'll break the walls down. And they broke the walls down. Oh. And they conquered that land, that yeah. promise. Yeah. And they were, the reputation was spreading that God would move anytime that Israel moved. Yeah. And everybody around them started realizing that Israel was somebody that you don't mess with. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody started fearing them. Yeah. But then, all of a sudden, something happened. Say it with me, something happened. happened. Here's what happened. God stopped moving. God stopped moving. Has God stopped moving in your life? Has he? When was the last time God didn't move in your life? When was the last time you felt God? Not goosebumps at church, because we can play a really nice song, get a Whitney Houston lookalike to come sing here, and then you get goosebumps everywhere. That is not a move of God, my friend. I'm wondering if God moved, would you recognize him? Because sometimes God is in the house, and we're like this. It's almost time to go. They're going to close the restaurant, but start texting everybody to leave right before this experience ends. And then we have a king here. And then sometimes God is moving, we don't recognize it. And sometimes God is moving and we do recognize it. But then sometimes God stops moving and we don't recognize it. Or sometimes God stops moving and we do recognize it. And that's exactly, that's exactly what happened to Joshua. 
with Joshua and the army of Israel as they were literally, they were literally walking towards the promise. God stopped moving. Here's what the Bible says, and here's how the story narrates. Here's how Joshua narrates the story. Joshua chapter 7. But Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord. A man named Achan. Can you say Achan? Achan. Mm -mm, Achan, just no good. A man named Achan had stolen some of these dedicated things, so the Lord was very angry with the Israelites. Joshua sent some of his men from Jericho, the land they just had conquered, to spy out the town of Ai. It's not Ai, it's Ai. East of Bethel, near Beth Haven. When they returned, here's what the spies told Joshua. There's no need for all of us to go up there. <laughs> it's so easy, Joshua. It won't take more than two or 3,000 men to attack Ai since. There are so few of Ai people. Don't make all our people struggle to go up there. So approximately 3,000 warriors were sent, but they were soundly defeated. A minor, minor army defeated the invincible God moving army of Israel. The men of Ai chased the Israelites from the town gate as far as the quarries, and they killed about 36. Wow, who were retreating down the slope. The Israelites were paralyzed with fear at this turn of events, and their courage melted away. And so now Joshua throws his body on the dust on the floor, and he starts despairing. And he starts going, Why, God? Why did you bring us this far if we're going to be defeated? We've come so far and nothing has turned out. We can't believe that we were defeated by a smaller army. God, what's going to happen to your people, Israel? We have such a great reputation and now our reputation is going to be lost. What's going to happen to your great name? Your great name is now going to be lost. And he goes into a panic attack and he's on the floor and he's crying and he's wondering what happened. Let's keep reading. But the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why are you lying on your face like this? Israel has sinned and broken my covenant. They have stolen some of the things that I commanded must be set apart for me. And they have not only stolen them, but have lied about it and? Hid. Say it a little louder. And? Hid. Remember what I said about front to the back, everybody in the back? And? Hid. The things among their own belongings. They've hidden. They've hidden something. And it's blended in. On the surface level, it looks like all the stuff is yours. On the surface level, it looks fine. On the surface level, everything seems like it is where it should be. But it's not what it seems with God. I'm going to say that one more time because I think that you need to wake up a little bit and actually apply it to your life. It's not always what it seems with God. Because you can fool your neighbor, you can fool your church, you can fool your friends, you can fool your family. But there's one God that you cannot fool. That's the God of heaven's army, Jehovah Jireh, Jesus Christ, King of Kings. He looks beneath the surface, he's paying attention. God had instructed the people of Israel not to take anything, but one man disobeyed. He took stuff he shouldn't have, and they became hidden things that Joshua didn't see. Things that Joshua didn't see. There may be hidden things in you that you don't see. So God tells Joshua, assemble all the tribes tomorrow. Get all the tribes, all of Israel. I'm going to show you who it was. So early the next morning, the Bible says, verse 16, Joshua brought the tribes of Israel before the Lord, and the tribe of Judah was singled out. Achan must have been shaking. Then the clans of Judah came forward, and the clan of Zerah was signed out. He's shaking more right now. Then the families of Zerah came forward, and the family of Zimri was singled out. He's shaking even more. Every member of Zimri's family was brought forward person by person, and Achan was singled out. Can you say, dang, somebody? Dang. dang. Achan replied, it is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins, and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. And I wanted them so much that I took them. They are hidden in the ground beneath my tent with the silver buried deeper than the rest. 
There are some things that you hide deeper than others, right? We preached about that a bit ago. Here's what I want you to understand. Hidden sin. Hidden sin stopped God from moving. Hidden sin. You know, we put a lot of effort, you know, to not let our family know what's going on. We put a lot of effort to not let our church know what's going on. We put a lot of effort in not allowing our upstream, which is the leaders of Crip Church, to not let them know what's going on. We, we, we put a lot of effort in not allowing the people that are closest to us to know what's really going on. And the question that I want to ask you is this, who do you think you're fooling? Us? Maybe. And you're nailing it. But there's one God that you can't fool. And here's the problem. That hidden sin stops God. Your hidden sin is stopping God from moving. Whatever your sin is. And that's why some people are in church trying to feel God. That's why some people travel years in Christianity trying to feel what God feels like. Trying to feel what other people look like they're feeling. Trying to talk the way that someone that feels God talks. And they can't feel God. You can't feel God. You haven't felt God. And I pray that my voice in this moment is grasping your soul. I pray that my voice is embarking this entire room and it's bringing you close, not to me, but to him. Because when you move, he moves. But he can't move if you don't move. And there's some sin in your life that is secret. It is hidden. There is disobedience that is hidden that in the... In the surface, it feels and it seems like you are a great Christian. And we're not saying that great Christian equals perfect Christian. We're not talking about perfection. Please go listen to more sermons on YouTube from our YouTube channel. We don't aim for perfection because if that's what Jesus was looking for, we would die trying to reach it. But we do need to repent from hidden sin. And what you need to understand is that hidden sin will keep God's presence away from you no matter how hard you try, no matter how many times you come to church. And some of you are like, well, I live in a Christian home. My parents are Christian. My grandma's Christian. My parents are Christian. My dad was a Christian. My dad was a pastor. My mom is a Christian. She's a prophet of God, whatever it is that you want to say. Can I tell you something? God has sons and daughters, not grandchildren. In other words... Bro, it's good that your grandma was Christian, but you can't have borrowed faith. You have to have a relationship with God on your own, bro. Just because your grandma was a Christian and she preached the word of God to you, she prays for you day and night, doesn't mean that you're all good. God wants to have a personal relationship with you. God is searching for your heart. God is seeking to have an intimate type of relationship with you. Someone say, "Amen." amen. But if you have hidden disobedience, God can't move. Look what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 40, 430, sorry. Do not make God's Holy Spirit have sorrow for the way that you live. The New King James Version says, do not sadden the Holy Spirit. Did you know that God can leave you? His presence can leave you. His spirit can leave you. And this is why if you're saddening the Holy Spirit, if you're causing sorrow to the Holy Spirit, He leaves and you can't feel him no more. And that's why some of you come to church and you're struggling going like, what the heck is all this? How come these people are so passionate? How could these people after coming from work go to church on a Thursday night to go pray? How is that possible? How is it possible that there are young people in this church that come before Sunday at five o'clock, that come before Sunday at three o'clock to set up, to meet and pray before six o'clock and then stay after that to clean up, tear down, and lock up while we're all at home. How is that possible? You want to know how it's possible? It's by the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of God. And that's what we sang. By your Spirit I will rise. Because there's some things that you can't do without the Spirit of God. And this is what he's saying. Ephesians 4.30. Do not make God's Spirit. Do not make the Holy Spirit have sorrow for the way that you live. Because he'll bounce. 
And for some of you, the way that you're living, he already bounced. And for some of you, the way that you're living, he's, he's already starting to leave. And you can feel him less and less and less and less and less and less. Until one day you reach the point where you spiritually die. And how do you know that you're spiritually dead? When you don't care about God. That's it. How could you care for someone you can't see or hear? I mean, for some of you, someone had to drag you here. I'll take you out to eat after, I promise. I'll buy you a Sunday. <laughs> it's like, okay, oh wow, a Sunday, that's what it took, eh? <laughs> Do you know the only one that can make you care for God? Is his Holy Spirit. And that's what that song was about. By your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected king is resurrecting me. What the hell does that even mean, right? I'm alive. What are you talking about? How is he going to resurrect me? No, it's spiritually, bro. Ephesians chapter 2, just two chapters before this, the Bible speaks about that we were dead in our sins and transgression. We had no need for God. We didn't feel like we needed God. Until his spirit went... Breathe life. Whoa, I need God. Yeah. Whoa, I need to get my life in order. Yeah. Dang, the way that I'm living hurts him. Yeah. Dang, I need to get to church. Yeah. Oh my goodness, I need to change my friends. Goodness sakes, this is a toxic relationship. I gotta leave it. Goodness sakes, there's sin in my life. Oh, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. That is caused by the Spirit of God. Yeah. But hidden disobedience kills that and that's why Isaiah 59 verse 2 says this it is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you who's he God, God. who's he God. it is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you it is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him legit Some of you are in this place trying to worship God and you can't for the life of you. Can't feel it. Can't do it. You can fake it. But faking it gets tiring, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Pretending gets tired, isn't it? Yeah. And God can't bless what you pretend you are. And so some people p pretend their worship and then they go, where's God? Where's God? And God's like, I've been waiting for you to move. Because I can't bless something fake. I can't bless something that you're really not. I can't bless what's not there. And that's why he's saying, it is your sins that separate you from God when you try. When you try to worship him. There are certain things that are hidden in your life. But these things are the clot. They are the blockage that keep Jesus out. And sometimes we become frustrated with God, ourselves, and our church because we can't feel him the way we know we should or we feel like he's not there or that he hasn't been there for us. Did you know that sometimes Christians get angry at God? They get angry at the church and they get frustrated with themselves because they can't feel God. They can't feel him. And they're going, what is wrong with God? He's just never making himself felt. What is wrong with my church? My church is not anointed. Or you blame it on yourself and you're like, oh, I'm such an idiot. Oh my God, I can't believe I did this. It's, it's, it's actually not a complicated issue. Your problem is not complicated and your problem is not a difficult one. Thank God it's not, amen? God lays it down and he's very simple and he says, there is hidden disobedience in your life that you need to get rid of if you want me to move in your life again. There are certain things in your life, certain lust problems that you carry, certain actions of lust that you keep on doing, and it's hidden. It's hidden, but it's hidden disobedience. No one sees it. The church won't know it. 
But I see it and I know it. And if it's hidden disobedience, even if you move, I can't move. So here's the question. Two questions. What was the last thing God spoke to you to do that you possibly started obeying, but then you reverted back to? What was that last thing? Who is that last thing? Here's the second question I want you to answer or wrestle with, actually. What is the one thing God has been repeating to you to do, but you just don't do it and you kid yourself thinking, I'm fine because God's grace will cover me. What's that one thing? What's that little thing thing? Who is that little thing thing? What's the one thing that God has been repeating to you to do and you just don't want to do it? Then you go, I don't need to because God's grace is good. God grace, God's grace covers me. Don't you realize hidden disobedience is outward rebellion against God and God cannot bless rebellion? So if you've been wondering, why isn't God moving? Why aren't my promises coming to pass? You're exactly like Joshua. Joshua's walking towards his promised land. And as he's walking towards his promise, God stopped moving. Some of you have been walking towards your promise, your blessing, the thing that God has shown you. And as you're moving, God stopped moving. And it's because there's an Achan in your heart that took some things and hid it. And it's hidden disobedience before God. And God is like, I can't bless that. Because you moved, but you moved the wrong way. You moved, but you didn't move in my timing. You moved, and you moved in your agenda with your plan. And your plan ain't my plan. I'm not going to bless your plan. I'm only going to bless my plan for your life. Because I'm wisdom. I am understanding. I'm intelligentsia. I'm all knowledge. I'm all knowing. I'm all purposeful. I'm all powerful. I'm magnificent. I am sovereign. I know what I'm talking about. And I have good plans for you. I have plans to prosper your little life and make it into a bigger life. God doesn't have plans to harm you. God doesn't have plans to kill you. God doesn't have plans to destroy you. God has plans to bless you beyond your imagination. The problem is that we have a lot of hidden things that stop God from moving. When I move, you move. Your hidden disobedience stops him. It cuts the connection. No Wi-Fi. God is no longer connected. And this is why you can, and you can't hear him. And you pray, and nothing happens. And you fast, but it was just a hunger strike. And you prophesy, and your words fall to the floor. Why? You got all the elements right. You just added an extra one that wasn't supposed to be there. Hidden disobedience. If I grabbed a chocolate brownie recipe, and I got the cocoa butter, I started doing keto, it's amazing. <laughs> so I'm into baking. <laughs> keto friendly, baking goods. Okay, now let's talk about baking, okay? Because it's a season in my life. I gotta... <laughs> Got to go buy an apron tomorrow. <laughs> Imagine if I took almond flour, because that's what you're supposed to bake with when you're doing keto. Any keto people in the house? <laughs> this is so sad. What kind of diet are you guys doing? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're fasting. That's right, we're fasting. <laughs> so you take almond flour, and then you take cocoa powder, sugar-free sweetener. You got the eggs. And you got the baking powder, okay? <laughs> and then you decide to go to your neighbor's yard and take one teaspoon of dog poo. And you put it in. <laughs> Nasty, right? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? That one ingredient changed everything. It's the same thing with God. 
You can come to church on Sunday. You can worship God. You can have faith. You can proclaim. You can sing. And you can have all the ingredients right. You can go to city. Listen, you can even come to midweek. Wow. It's like seeing a unicorn. It's rare. You can have all of that. But if you add one touch, one tablespoon of hidden disobedience, the recipe is not the same. God can't move. And here's the thing, and I'm almost done. When we fast, we expect God to move. When we pray, we expect God to move. When we move in faith, we expect God to move, right? Okay. When God gives us an instruction, what do you think he's expecting? An argument? An excuse? A delay? A debate? A negotiation? A diversion? Look, birdie, God. Your version of his instruction? I was talking to one of my leaders and I told my leader, leader, when I give you an instruction, I expect to receive the instruction that I gave you, not your version of my instruction. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, that's it. And I was like, what do you mean that's it? He said, that's it, exactly. See, son, when I give you an instruction, I expect for you to obey my version of my instruction, not your version. Dang. And that's why I bring you to my last point. What's the move you have to make? What's the move that you have to make? Is it a move of faith? Is God asking you to move and make the resume to land a job in the promotion? What is God asking you to do? There are moves of faith that we have to make. That God can't bless you if you don't move. God would not have split the sea if Moses wouldn't have taken responsibility to extend the staff. God can't give you the job if you don't make the resume, my bro. You got to make it. (laughs) And then you got to print it. And take it personally, bro. Take it personally. And dress with a suit. Not 40 size bigger than your body, though. Dress with a suit that fits you. And lose the gangster talk. And talk like a gentleman. Comb your hair. Pull up the pants. Learn how to tie a tie. (laughs) And go get the job. And if you move, God moves. Take your education to the next level if you want the promotion. Show up early. Leave late. Some of you want the promotion and you want to do the bare minimum. Some of you want to be noticed and receive the promotion, but you have an attitude that stinks. And God is saying, you need to move before I can move. If you don't have your attitude in place, I can't bless you with favor. I don't bless brats. I bless sons and daughters that they know how to compose themselves. If you want the wife, you got to lose that dirty language. Because my daughter is precious. She has her head in her shoulders. I'm getting into dating stuff just to let you know because we're starting that dating relationships, that relationship series very soon. Are you excited about it? Don't play games. I'm excited about it. So is God asking you to have faith to make the move? And start the business. You're waiting for a business opportunity to come knock at your front door. And God is saying, that's how it starts. You got to grind. But you got to have faith to do it. Right? Is he asking you to have faith to jump into the unknown and realize that God will catch you in the unknown? There are some things that God is asking you to move because he's not going to bless you until you move it. He can't bless you if you don't have the faith. You have to make a move of faith. And so some of you are in that season where you have to make a move of faith, but some of you are in a different season, and this is your season. you got to make a move of full obedience, not partial, because we like to make it our own version in order for it to be comfortable and feel comfortable. A move of full obedience. 
Maybe God is asking you, pause the business. Maybe God is asking you, pause your plan. And so you pause it for a little bit, but then you go back to it. Maybe God is saying, cut those friends off of your life. They're toxic. They're an evil, demonic, rebellious, bratty influence on your life. You gotta cut those people off. Or maybe God has been asking you to make a move of full obedience when it comes to one relationship. And he's saying, you gotta cut that one relationship off. And you do for three days. And on the third day, that toxic relationship rises back to life. (laughs) Is he asking you to do a chair time and spend time with him, but you haven't? Some of you are waiting for God to move and you're asking God to move in your life and you haven't even set a chair time to hear him. Pastor, everything in my life is going to hell. Everything is falling apart. No one likes me. No one loves me. Everything's moving bad. I'm losing my job. I'm losing my hair. I'm losing everything, Lord. I'm I'm pastor. And then I go, have you been praying? No. Maybe that's the problem. That God wants you to move before he can move. God wants you to make a move first. There are moments where we have to wait on God to give us direction. But the problem is this, that we get God to give us direction. And when he gives it to us, we don't like it. But we still expect the reward of the instruction without following the instruction. It's partial obedience, not full obedience. And maybe nothing's happening in your life. God isn't moving. And now you're upset. It's funny that we expect God to move, but we don't want to move. We want the healing, we want the promise, and we want the blessings to come fast. But we don't want to fast. (laughs) Got it, right? Okay. Took a while for some. Okay. There's a word that the Holy Spirit deposited in me, and that is, when you move, I'll move. But you need to move if you want to see me move. And so this year, what is the thing that God is asking you? And if you don't move, God can't move. So what is your move? And here's the last one, a move of repentance. I'm going to read this. Gina, if you can come up on the piano. Sometimes the move that we need to make in order to have God move again is one of repentance. Repentance from the things that sometimes are unseen. So once again, I want to remind you that Joshua was walking towards his promise. And there was an unseen sin. Did you know that sometimes there is unseen sin in your life that you don't know about? And it's blocking God from moving. And in order for you to repent from this sin, you need to come to God in humility and say exactly what King David used to say. Search my heart. Search my heart. What is in me that is keeping you from me? And to repentance, it's humility. It's exactly what Joshua did on that field. He said, why is this happening? What is going on? Reveal it to me. And God gave him exact detail of what was the next step for him to make in order for him to remove that hidden thing so that God can keep on moving. We need to ask God to save us from the deception of our sin. Because sometimes, listen to me, sometimes we're so deceived by our own sin that we can't even see our sin. If you sincerely repent and cut out the sin in your life and turn the other way, you will instantaneously mend your communion with God. There are some things that are hidden that block God. And this is why you keep on trying to get close to God, but you can't. This is why you try to have willpower to be close to Him, but you can't. And it's not that you're a bad person. It's just that there's possible hidden disobedience or hidden things in your life 
that are blocking you. And so you need God. You need God to reveal it to you. But that starts when you make a move of repentance, where you come and you sincere yourself with God and you go, what is going wrong? What is wrong in my life? Why can't I need you the way that that guy needs you? I don't even feel like I need you. Why can't I feel you the same way I used to feel you? Why can't I experience the true definition of a real relationship with God? Why is it that I come to church and I leave, but I come one way and I leave the same way? Why can't I leave different? Why do I get disinterested when it comes to your things, but I'm so interested in dumb things? You gotta ask, you gotta talk to God real that way. Why is it that there's this lust that keeps controlling my decisions? It keeps manipulating what I do, even though I know what I'm doing, I don't like. I'm not proud of it, I'm not happy, I enjoy it in a moment, but then I just feel completely dissatisfied with myself. What is it? Gotta go to God in a move of repentance. And when you repent and you cut out the hidden disobedience, your relationship with God instantaneously gets mended and the Wi-Fi connection goes back on. You need God. You need Him. You need His presence. You need His Word. You need His plan to unfold in your life. You need His Spirit to bring you to life. Is it hard? Of course it is. Will it feel like something is being torn off your soul and off your heart? Maybe. But you need to decide what is greater in your life. God or that thing. Watch this. You either let God move or sin move. One or the other. It's either God moves or sin moves. And I'm going to put my notes on the screen. And here's the last thing I wanted to read to you. Repent tonight. Today. Turn your life around. Confess your sin to God and surrender your thing to Him. Bring it out into the open verbally and establish your lost connection with Him once again. God loves you. He's speaking to you because He cares and wants to bless your life beyond your imagination. Listen to His voice. Make the decision right now, tonight, today. Amen. Thank you for watching our weekly talk at Crave Church. A new sermon will be released every week, so make sure you subscribe and turn on your post notifications. With that, you'll be notified each time we upload a new sermon. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.